Obviously, you're not going to learn to play bebop by just studying three licks, but if you want to add that sound to your playing and mix in some bebop in your solos, it's not a bad place to start. And if you want to learn how to play jazz, then you definitely also want to check out these lines. My name is Jens Larsen, learn jazz, make music. Having the right vocabulary for a style of music is really what determines whether you can play that music or not. And I clearly remember when I was starting out playing jazz, I transcribed solos, practiced scales and arpeggios, and then I tried to improvise jazz solos. And I quickly became aware that even though I knew the changes of the song, that my solos did not really sound like jazz, they were just a lot of correct notes. What helped me and what will probably also help you is learning licks and also start to make your own licks with the same type of melodies. So studying licks is not just learning them, it's also learning how to write and use certain types of melodies in your playing. That's really what vocabulary is all about. This first one you probably heard me mention before, and it is really the closest thing I know to instant bebop. Playing an arpeggio as a triplet with a leading note. This is a way of playing arpeggios that is really part of so many classic Parker licks, like this one. And of course it works for other chords as well. It's a great way to add a little variation to an eighth note line and the faster notes really add some energy and some excitement to your solo. The way you, of course, practice this is to play this pattern through the scale as diatonic arpeggios. And then you start writing licks with them and there are many things that you can work on. You can combine two arpeggios. Here I'm using E minor seven and C major seven over the C major seven arpeggio and combining that with a C major seven arpeggio. And of course, both of these are solid choices on a C major seven chord. Another option is to follow a triplet arpeggio with some chromatic leading notes. As you can tell, I'm presenting these licks as building blocks and that's really because that is how they will be the most useful to you and help you develop your own language. As I mentioned in the intro, my experience is that making your own licks and getting those to sound like bebop is one of the best ways to learn to play bebop. And that's actually also pretty much how Barry Harris teaches it. I will return to this a little later in the video and also talk about why I don't really like bebop scales. <gasps> This lick is called the Honeysuckle Rose lick because it's the main motif in Fat Waller's song Honeysuckle Rose, but it's also an extremely common and very beautiful way to play arpeggios in bebop. And it is one of the most melodic ways to add large intervals to your eighth note lines, which can really stop them from sounding predictable and boring. This is really just a way to play an inversion of the arpeggio. It's also referred to as octave displacement. You start on the root and then you play the arpeggio, but after the root, you move everything down an octave, which gives you a beautiful skip from the root down to the third and a natural way of getting back up again. Charlie Parker, Grant Green and George Benson do this all the time in their solos. And you can make so many great lines with this as well by adding it to some simple scale melodies. Or some chromatic enclosures. In fact, the topic of octave displacement is maybe worth an entire video. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in a video on that. The most important goal with studying this or any jazz stuff is really to be melodic, to play strong bebop lines that really flow and avoid having strange unrelated fragments next to each other that don't make any sense. As you can tell, I think you will learn about making strong bebop lines by practicing to compose those lines. And that is simply because composing lines is like improvising them, except you can go back and figure out how to make the line sound even better. And in that way, you're really working on building your own vocabulary of strong lines, and you're also practicing putting them together in the perfect way. By working on constructing lines, you're giving your imagination and ears time to really listen to the sound of what you're practicing, and you're making sure that you can fit the different pieces together in lines without suddenly changing, because you are skipping from one idea to the next and making a melody that doesn't really work. And that's why I think it's really useful to spend a part of your practice time composing lines, exploring what they sound like, and really knowing how to make solid bebop lines or lines like any artist or any style that you want to make. This phrase is probably most famous from David Baker's books on bebop and a symbol of 
people studying bebop, but it's of course also a common and useful phrase to have in your vocabulary. This is a phrase for a five or a two chord, so I decided to write it out as a G7 lick, not as a C major seven lick. The combination of some chromaticism and a nice interval skip makes this lick sound very melodic. The first part is moving from G down to F through the G flat as a passing note, so. And then it skips up to A and ends on E and D. This lick is a great building block both on G7 and on the D minor 7 chord. If you use it on the D minor 7, then you get something like this. This line starts with an F major 7 arpeggio, the arpeggio from the third of D minor 7, and then a scale run with a leading note, which takes us up to the G on G7, and here I'm playing the David Baker lick, so. And then they're stopping here and following that up with an E, which just naturally works as a resolution to C major seven. But it works equally well if you use it on a D minor seven, like this. The first part of this is just the David Baker lick, so. Then I'm following this up with an enclosure of the B, which is C and A sharp, taking me to B, which is of course just signaling the G7, and here I'm playing the B half diminished arpeggio, so the arpeggio from the third, and then adding another enclosure, so F and D sharp, to take me to the third of C major. I often get asked to make lessons on bebop scales, and while I don't think anybody died from checking out a few bebop scales, I do think that the way people are asked to practice and use them is really just helping them play very predictable stepwise lines that are also very boring. And to me, that's the opposite of what is great about bebop. You want to learn to play great surprising lines with melodic twists and turns and practicing to play chord tones on the beat and leading notes on the off beats is just not what that is about. I still suspect that there were more money made with bebop scales than there were with bebop. If you're interested in digging deeper into some of the amazing lines that are a part of bebop, then check out this video on how to improvise over a jazz blues. I'm covering several techniques that are coming straight from Charlie Parker, and you probably already know that blues is a huge part of jazz and bebop. Who is your favorite bop guitarist, and is it really a bebop player?